So just give me a smile. No, that's a proper smile. Yeah. You do. Okay, who are we? Okay, yeah. Let's go up on the top again. All right, who are we? Who are we? Who are we? We are Holy Spirit empowered servants like, like Jesus. Jesus. We are we are we are the hospitable family of Jesus. We are we are strategic missionaries for Jesus. We are disciples devoted to Jesus. We are helping people find and follow Jesus. We, we are, are we are City, City Gates. We are City Gates. Oh my God, you like nailed. It. Memory kicked in. <laughs> Hi everyone and welcome to City Gates at Home. We are so happy to have you here. I'm Jess. And I'm Brett. Wait, no. Are you Jess? I'm oh, Brett. You're Brett. I'm, I'm Brett. Yes. Um, welcome to our Easter Sunday service. We are so happy to have you here and we're so glad that you joined us. Yeah. Um, I can't reiterate that enough. Guests, Thank you so much for uh, spending this time with us today. Uh, we really hope you get something out of the service. Yeah. Um, if you are new here and you maybe haven't heard of an app we use, it's called the Church Center app. We use it for almost all things church and we love it. We use it for things like checking into Sunday service, for giving, for our community groups. If you're not part of a community group, definitely join one. They're amazing. We love our community yeah. group. It's yeah, our I family. Our, our community group is exactly that, that, that second family uh, you never had or never wanted. Um, but they, they challenge you and they, they help you engage uh, with, our, with our Sunday content, so it's great. Some other things you can do on the Church Center app is uh, watch sermons, uh, any other extra videos or things we might have on there. All of that's available on the Church Center app and you can uh, check it out. I think the link for that's on the screen. One other thing you can do through the Church Center app is giving. Uh, for our guests, this component's not for you, so feel free to just kind of tune out. But uh, f the reason we're able to do all of these things is through the generosity uh, of the church. And so first, thank you so much for your continuous giving. Um, and you know the, the ways to do that, if you're not familiar with, are, are on screen. Mm -hmm. um, and um, now, that giving is one way that um, we love to be generous and we love to worship. Uh, another type of worship uh, is, yeah, no, I'm just totally blank on that one. <laughs> is singing. <laughs> and giving is a great form of worship, but there's also another great form of worship that we like to do, which is singing. So join us now to sing. Please join me in reading Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 5 through 6, as we prepare our hearts for worship. Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you.
speak, you made no sound. You died for your accusers. And as your blood fell to the ground, you redefined my future. has claimed his throne but now and soon forever
Turn around. 
Well, hey everyone, my name is Vic. Uh, welcome to our Easter Sunday service. Uh, this whole weekend, our message to you, whether you are a city gator or a guest, is that God loves you. Uh, God loves you like XO. The X is a cross that represents uh, what we looked at on Friday, uh, Jesus dying on that cross in our place for our sin. It's the end of sin, it's the end of condemnation. Amazing news. And today we're looking at the O, which represents the empty tomb. Uh, yes, the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the implications of that for you and me and for the whole world. And if you know Friday was the death of sin and condemnation, well then today is the death of death. Sounds like good news. Uh, and we're going to read one of the accounts of the resurrection of Jesus uh, from the Bible out of the Gospel of Mark. And uh, I'd love for you to join with me. It's Mark chapter 16. I have my Bible. You can just follow along on the screen. Verses 1 to 7 says this. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. That's Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. And they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. This is God's word. Don't we all want resurrection? Doesn't that sound just great? I think that, you know, it's built into us really to long for that. You, you think of the emotions when springtime comes around. You know, winter is all dead and dreary. Uh, and then there's signs of new life. And, and, and you know, we just change. Uh, our mood changes. It's just so exciting. And I love what Martin Luther wrote about this. He said, um, Our Lord has written the promise of the resurrection, not in books alone, but in every leaf in springtime. And I would agree with him. And I think the reason is, is because of death being such a problem. Uh, we really do feel like it's an imposter. It's not supposed to be here. Uh, because death uh, is the result of sin. Uh, we die because we sin. Uh, that is what uh, we learn right in the beginning of the Bible. And, and sin is very real. And on Friday, we looked at what sin means. And maybe you've got that question. You know, I love in the English language, uh, right in the middle of that word is, is I. And that's a great uh, example of what sin is, is us at the center being autonomous, self-centered lives, wanting to live our lives apart from God. That was the problem of, of the first uh, uh, human beings, Adam and Eve. Uh, God created uh, the, the world, He created the universe, and He put them in a garden uh, uh, to, to flourish, and, and He was generous, and you can eat of anything, and there was a tree of life uh, there. That, um, and then there was also a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and God said, don't eat of that. If, if you eat of that, you will surely die, and, and in doing so, you would take creation down with you. And so it was a simple boundary, really, where God was saying, uh, if, you, if you do not eat of that, you, you can live out your allegiance to me, your obedience to me, your affection for me, your dependence upon me. But when you eat of that, and, and they did eat of it, uh, you would declare, you would make the statement, my will, not your will, God, my will be done. And, and Jesus uh, coming this Easter weekend is a, uh, a, a moment where we celebrate the reversal of what took place in that garden. Because Jesus found himself in a garden uh, just before his crucifixion, saying the exact opposite of what Adam and Eve had said. You know, he prayed there, Father, not my will be done, but your will be done. Can you see that? Completely different. And you know, a few moments before that, he, he was with his disciples around a meal. And, and you know, Satan uh, uh, deceived Adam and Eve, lied to them, said to them, take and eat of this tree. If you eat of it, you won't die. You know, lying to them, twisting God's words. 
And Jesus is now standing in front of his disciples with the, the bread and the cup. We took communion. That's that meal that we take regularly represents that meal. And he said to his disciples now, take and eat. I will die. Take and eat. This represents my death, my blood shed, my body uh, given for you. Uh, can you see already that in Jesus coming, he was reversing and undoing what started uh, right in the beginning in the Garden of Eden. And uh, I love that Jesus is promising to turn and is be has begun to turn it around. You know, when God created everything, he, you know, the cosmos, the world, he ended with humanity, with Adam and Eve as the last thing. And, and, and Jesus' resurrection is, is amazing because it's him starting with humanity to fix it and, and he'll end with all of creation. The Bible actually tells us that, that creation groans. There's a sense that there's labor pains. They are waiting for that final day when he will put everything right. And Jesus being raised from the dead is the first fruits that says the death and the curse that was introduced in the garden. I'm gonna undo that. I began with creation, I ended with humanity, but I'm gonna start with humanity and end with creation in my restoration. And Jesus is the first fruits of that. He's the firstborn of creation, actually. The Bible describes him. His resurrection is exactly that. And if Jesus stayed in the grave, if he wasn't resurrected, there is no assurance for you and me that, first of all, what happened on Friday, our sin is paid for. There's no assurance of that. And there's no assurance that he will set everything right in the end if he's still in the grave. Just think about the sentence that, that a criminal would have to pay if they had to be in jail. If they live out their sentence you know, in full uh, and it's over, they can walk out. They're, they're free. They don't have to remain in the jail cell. And it's the, it's the same with Jesus. Jesus truly paid for our sin it completely. When he cried out on that cross, it is finished. The resurrection is a, is a credit to that. It was truly paid for in full. Death could not hold him anymore. The resurrection is a vindication of that. In many ways, it's like the massive declaration by God saying, I told you so, I'm going to deal with it. I'm going to do it properly. I think that is amazing. And so when Jesus cried out, I am, uh, it is finished on the cross. One writer said he didn't say I am finished because in many ways with his resurrection, he's saying, I have just begun. I've just started my work of renewal. But maybe before I look into what that means for us, this, this resurrection life, this renewal, maybe you're a guest and you go, oh, this, all this talk of resurrection, come on now, it's 2021. Uh, we can't still believe this kinds of stuff, you know. Uh, how can we make sense of this? How can we believe this? So let me just spend a few moments there, maybe helping you or pointing you in the right direction that you can do a bit of investigation yourself. Firstly, in Jesus' time, leading up to him as well, there were many messianic movements, many, many liberators that rose up. Um, and they all, uh, were, uh, they all died, but many of them were killed because of this. And as soon as they were killed, uh, that movement died down, except for one. You guessed it right, it's, it's Christianity. Uh, in fact, it didn't co collapse, it exploded. Over the next 300 years, uh, the Roman Empire uh, it's Christianity spread like wildfire. And much of the scriptures uh, account some of that uh, for us. And, and, and why? Well, it happened because of what happened to, to the leader after he died. And, and I want to say to you that the Bible is a reliable record of these things. You, you can trust it. Uh, you can investigate through these pages. And, and if you go to our website as a church, citygates.ca, forward slash Jesus, I think that would work. There's a couple of things over there that, that, that can help you. You can read up some more if you like. But um, I, I, I trust this. This is not legend. Maybe as we read uh, Mark chapter 16, it, it didn't sound like legend to you. It sounded more like history, the way that Mark records uh, this account for us. Uh, and so do, do check it out yourself. You know, one of the amazing things, the, the, the uh, cases for the resurrection of Christ, is the women that we see here at the tomb being the first ones to, to hear that he has risen and to tell others that it is so. 
Uh, in ancient times, uh, you might be familiar with the fact that women were marginalized, you know, to the extent that, that uh, they, they, they were, uh, they didn't carry a lot of credibility. Certainly you wouldn't use them uh, to, to, to verify an account. And so if you are going to be making up a story, uh, this is not the way you should do it. You, you should not, at least not in the ancient times, uh, include women as your, your first announcers of this truth. But you know, maybe I can be a little funny here um, uh, to our modern hearers, uh, and, and, and you know, I, I'll use myself as an ex example. My wife often asks me to go find things, you know, in the fridge or in the closet, uh, and I often come back, you know, and I say it's not there. I can't find it. Uh, and then she goes and she, she discovers it. And I just feel like, you know, women have this ability to find things and guys don't. I don't know what it is. And I know it's a stereotype, but I've been married for long enough and I've spoken to enough uh, husbands and wives to, to think that I'm, I'm kind of on the right track over here. And so I think to us modern eras, you know, like I, I can't even, you know, find uh, something on the first page of Google. Um, you know, maybe a little resurrection joke here is that, you know, how do you hide a dead body? You put it on page two of Google, because I don't think I've ever clicked on the second one myself. But here uh, we see the, the, the woman um, not finding the body of Jesus. And, and, and to my modern ears, I'm like, look, if the lady says he is not there, he is not there. Like, you know, if I say he's not there, you know, and a lady goes back and, and looks, she, she generally finds what I can't find. Uh, and so maybe to our modern ears, uh, the case that the woman said, uh, you know, he's not there, he's risen, um, you know, should be taken seriously. But, uh, you know, we continue uh, with our uh, your argument here uh, because you're not alone in your doubts if you doubt that. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the disciples were told by Jesus over and over again that he would die and he would, uh, would, uh, would be raised to life again. He, he said that to them many times. And so you'd think that if they were listening to Jesus, that at least on the third day after his death, one or two of them would go, remember when he said that and go to the tomb and, and try and verify if that would be the case. But we don't have any record of that because they had their doubts, resurrections. These things don't happen. And even the woman who went up to the tomb, they didn't go there expecting that. They went there with the spices and the ointments and things that you would use to, you know, get a dead body ready for, for long-term burial. Nobody expected a resurrection. Uh, in fact, the, the listeners or the readers or the hearers of the day, like the Greeks, they themselves didn't believe in the resurrection. That would have been bad news to them. The, the Greeks wanted to be liberated from the body. You know, that, that, that was their, their version of the afterlife. Not to have a, you know, you, you continue on in your body. Uh, even the Jews, their view of the resurrection was not the way that Jesus was raised from the dead. They had an idea of the resurrection, but it was more of a Costco style, like in the end, bulk, you know, renewal of all things, which is partially correct, but um, not in the way that Jesus was resurrected. And so, you know, maybe you're thinking, uh, you, you know, early people were predisposed to believe this, but I would say to you that they were as skeptic of it as you and I may be today. Uh, and, and the New Testament records many witnesses of the, the resurrected Jesus. You know, it tells us that many people, you know, hundreds of people had seen Jesus. And uh, if this was a hoax, well, I tell you, it was an amazing uh, thing to pull off because they all would have had to say the same thing. Uh, many of them died still believing that. Many of them actually were tortured um, and, and killed for, for, for not recanting on that. And the disciples uh, is a great example of that. Uh, and the change in their lives, by the way, before the from, from, from before the resurrection to, to after the res resurrection is remarkable. Uh, you know, all of the disciples died uh, with this conviction. You know, most of them were tortured, uh, you know, in an attempt for them to, to recant, to go back on this claim that Jesus is alive. And for, with, for three years, they, they walked with Jesus. I mean, they saw incredible miracles. They, they heard incredible teachings. Uh, and, and no wonder when Jesus, you know, started saying in, in Matthew 26, you know, listen, when the, sh the, the, the shepherd is struck, the sheep's going to be scattered. He was talking about his death. He's like, you're all going to run. And they all said, no, you're amazing. You're our, our leader. We, we will never abandon you. Uh, um, it wasn't just Peter who said, I won't do that. And we know Jesus said, no, actually, by the way, you'll deny me three times before the rooster crows. Um, it was all of them that said and, and pledged their uh, allegiance to Jesus, saying it'll never happen. And then Jesus gets arrested. 
And what happens? They all scatter. They all scatter. And yet when the resurrected Jesus showed up, they went to their graves declaring that he is alive. The only explanation we can have for that is that Jesus is alive. It is the very life of the disciples themselves. When Jesus showed up, the risen Christ showed up, they couldn't shut up. You couldn't shut them up. And here we are 2,000 years later. And so maybe these are just a few things for you to think about. I actually would love for us to go back to the scriptures and look at one of the accounts where the risen Jesus uh, appeared to the disciples. And that can be found in John chapter 21, verses 15 to 19. Again, I'll read from my Bible. You can just follow along on screen. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. This is just uh, um, John here writing about, you know, the the martyrdom of Peter. Uh, and, And after saying this, Jesus said to him, follow me. Let's backtrack just a little bit here. Um, This is after a breakfast that took place. So what happened? The disciples, after the death of Jesus, went back to fishing. Seven of the disciples were fishing here. And they tried to fish all night, caught nothing. And then the next morning, there was a man on the shore who cried out and said, hey, just throw your nets on the other side. They did that. They caught like 150 odd fish. And in that moment, they realized that man is Jesus because it was very similar to an account with Jesus right in the beginning of his ministry when he called the disciples. Same story, all night, caught nothing. He said, throw your nets out again. They caught lots. And then Jesus says, I'm going to make you fishers of men. You're going to be disciples of me. Come, come follow me. And so, you know, it was like, this is Jesus. They get out of the boat and they go have breakfast. And then here's this account with Jesus, with Peter himself. And uh, remember, you know, I referred to Peter denying Jesus three times, even though he said he wouldn't do that. And isn't it amazing how Jesus restores him, the resurrected Christ here? He gives him an opportunity to three times affirm his love. I mean, there's a connection there. You know, three times Peter denied him. So he doesn't just graciously restore him, but he specifically restores him. Isn't that amazing? But he also actually restores all of these disciples because, again, they went back to fishing. It's kind of like they said, well, we tried that thing with Jesus and it didn't work. Let's go back to our previous professions. And Jesus, even at the end with Peter, says to him, follow me. It's like he reinstates them. He says, I know you you messed up. You know, I know you're ashamed because you abandoned me. I know you're ashamed, Peter, because you denied me. But he, he comes and he, it, this, this moment is amazing because what Jesus did on the cross uh, is, is actually in effect now in the disciples' lives. What do I mean by that? Well, if anybody could shame the disciples, it would be Jesus. I mean, Jesus could shame us all, even, even with, uh, with Peter's account here. He says to Jesus, hey, you know everything. I mean, you knew I was going to deny you. And I said, I won't. And I did. You're asking me if I love you now. You know everything. You know I love you. Jesus knows everything. He knows even the acts that we commit that, not, that, that are not in love for God. And so if anybody can shame us, it's him. And, and yet he doesn't do that with the disciples here. Because he didn't just die for their sin, but he also died for their shame. He took that shame of the cross upon himself, the, the shame of our sin upon him. And so in that moment, you know, he he can be gracious with his disciples and they can know for a fact that they are forgiven, that their shame is taken care of because he is there. He's resurrected. He has conquered. It is truly finished. He paid for it all. Uh, And, and, you know, their their guilt was uh, uh, wiped away, you know, when Jesus died on the cross. You know, that's what it means to be forgiven. They experienced the forgiveness with the resurrected Christ there. But, you know, in that moment... They're also experiencing the justification. Justification is different to forgiveness. Forgiveness has got to do with guilt and your past, but justification has to do with your present and your future. And and, you know, when Jesus died on that cross, 
It was an act of obedience. He said, Father, not my will, your will be done in the garden, which is saying, okay, I will go and die in their place. And, and so all of Jesus' life was perfect obedience. Even his death on the cross was obedience to the Father. And on that cross, our sin was imputed upon him. He died in our place for our sin so we could be forgiven. But also at his resurrection, saying that it's paid in full. It means that his obedience, his obedience all the way to death is credited to us. His obedience was credited to the disciples. Like they were justified. They st stood there with the resurrection Christ, knowing that what he accomplished on the cross is, is finished. It's done. It's true. Shame-free, guilt-free. That is so powerful. They were pardoned. Yes, but they also received Jesus' perfection uh, that was credited to them. And, and the resurrection is proof that those two things, those spiritual truths, that, that it's real. It's re if you put your faith in Jesus, you are forgiven because he's raised from the dead. If you put your faith in Jesus, you are not only pardoned, but you, the perfection, you are justified. That is also given to you. And when God looks at you, he sees Jesus because you're in Christ and he was perfect. And your imperfection was upon Christ on that cross. This is amazing stuff. The resurrection is, is a declaration that that is true. Uh, but that's a spiritual reality, but there's also a physical um, a reality there. I mean, there is Jesus having breakfast with him, like with, in a resurrected body. That is an amazing thing. And if we believe the resurrection, the spiritual dynamics and the physical dynamics of the resurrection, it will change the way that we live our lives. It will, it must change. Think about this. Why often are we so uh, uh, upset and so um, uh, bothered by suffering? Why is suffering so hard? Because we don't believe the resurrection. Because we, we think that this life is all that there is. Uh, and so we cannot endure suffering. Why is it sometimes that we just cannot deal with criticism? Or, or, or when um, we, we worry about what other, what other people think of us? Well, I, I think it's a result of us not believing the truth that the resurrection declares. That you are loved, that you are free, that you're forgiven, that you're accepted. You see, so, so believing in the resurrection, even to be a Christian, is to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that Christ has raised him from the dead. And a failure to believe that means that we are, you know, moved by suffering and, and, and opinions of others. And, and even things like a lockdown can get us down completely. It's actually because in, in, in a, a level deep down, we don't believe the resurrection. And I want to declare it today that it is true. It is true because even uh, if it is true, we would be free from all of life's anxieties and we can genuinely face the worst because Jesus endured the worst and came out victorious on the other side. Uh, you know, even our suffering now, if the resurrection is true, uh, then it will be glorious as we look back because Jesus comes to his disciples now with scars in his hands and in his side. When they doubted his resurrection, he said, come, have a look at it. Isn't it amazing that the scars were there in the resurrected body of Jesus? You know, these disciples thought that the scars, those scars represented a, a ruined life. They gave up three years of their life and Jesus was crucified. And they thought, there we go. That, those scars it just represents the worst of the worst. And yet here's Jesus with those scars. And, and he's showing them that actually what they thought would ruin their lives, in fact, saved their lives. And the resurrection it gives us the endurance and the power and the perspective to understand that all of suffering can and will be turned around by God for, for our good and for His glory. And in the end, uh, you know, uh, it, when we are resurrected, uh, uh, we look back at those scars and those suffering moments and it enables us almost to enjoy and to delight in that eternal resurrected state even more. Uh, I want us to end just by reading Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 31 to 35. And I'm going to skip verse 36 if you allow me to do that. Um, but again, follow along with me on the screen. It says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Jesus Christ is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, 
who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword or a lockdown? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is good news. What can separate us? Nothing, because Jesus is alive. At least nothing successfully. You might go through the most difficult t- things on, this, on the, in the, you know, this side of death, but because of Christ's resurrection, it will not have the final word. He is alive. I want us to end off by singing in Christ alone together. But before we do that, if you've come to follow Jesus, maybe even as I've been preaching, something happened inside of you, you, you wanted to follow, you want to follow him, uh, you know, confess your sin and, and need for him. Hey, that's great. Uh, maybe it was this weekend, maybe Friday, maybe it was this last year, you've journeyed with us online and you've come to follow Jesus. Call yourself a Christian now. You know, one of the, the, the things Christians do is, is we get baptized as a declaration of our resurrection life. We, we, we go under the water, identifying with the death of Jesus, and we come up out of the water, declar- declaring that we are alive, made alive in him, and, and resurrection is also our destiny, because his, his resurrection life is, is accredited to us. And, and so if you've come to faith in Jesus, uh, why don't you sign up for baptism online? I don't know when we'll do it, you know, maybe a month or two from now, certainly in the summer when a few of us can get together by the lake perhaps uh, and, and just celebrate that you too have put your faith in the resurrection, resurrected Jesus. Um, so yeah, we're going to sing now in Christ alone. And if you are a follower of Jesus that have not been baptized, why don't you sign up for baptism and we'll tell you when that is going to happen. But hey, he is risen. He's risen indeed. I trust you will have an amazing rest of your weekend. We'll catch you uh, next Sunday again.
thirsting for 